The year is 52 BC. Julius Caesar, the ambitious and ruthless Roman general, has been waging a brutal war against the tribes of Gaul for six years. He has conquered most of the territory and imposed his rule over millions of people. But not all Gauls are willing to submit to Rome. A young and charismatic chieftain named Vercingetorix has united the remaining tribes in a desperate bid for freedom. He has rallied a massive army of warriors, ready to fight and die for their homeland. Caesar is not deterred by this challenge. He knows that if he can crush Vercingetorix and his army, he will secure his fame and fortune, and pave his way to power in Rome. He also knows that he has to act fast, before his political enemies in the Senate can undermine his authority and recall him from Gaul. He gathers his loyal legions and marches towards the heart of the rebellion. The two armies clash in several battles across Gaul, each one more bloody and fierce than the last. Caesar wins some, Vercingetorix wins others, but neither side can gain a decisive advantage. The fate of Gaul hangs in the balance. Finally, Vercingetorix decides to retreat to a fortified town called Elysium, where he hopes to withstand a siege until reinforcements arrive from other tribes. He has about 80,000 men with him, including his best warriors and cavalry. He also has thousands of civilians, who have followed him from their villages and farms. Caesar follows him with about 60,000 men, including his veteran legionaries and Germanic allies. He arrives at Elysia and sees that it is a formidable position. The town is built on a hill, surrounded by steep slopes and deep valleys. It has strong walls and gates, and plenty of food and water. Caesar knows that a direct assault would be suicidal. He also knows that he cannot afford to wait for a long siege, as his supplies are limited and his enemies are gathering. He decides to use his engineering skills and build a double ring of fortifications around Elysia, one facing inward to prevent Vercingetorix from escaping, and one facing outward to repel any relief force that might come to his aid. He orders his men to work day and night, digging ditches, erecting walls, towers, and traps, creating a deadly obstacle course for anyone who tries to break through. It takes them about three weeks to complete the task. They build a total of 24 miles of fortifications, making Elysia one of the most besieged places in history. Vercingetorix watches from the town as Caesar's men work tirelessly. He realizes that he is trapped, but he does not lose hope. He still has a large army with him, and he knows that his allies are on their way with more than 100,000 men. He sends out his cavalry to harass Caesar's workers and tried to find a weak spot in his defenses. He also sends out messengers to coordinate with the relief force and urge them to hurry. He tries to conserve his food and water as much as possible, but he soon faces a crisis. His army is too large for the town, and there is not enough food for everyone. He makes a difficult decision. He orders the Mandubii, the local tribe who owns the town, to expel their women and children from Elysia. He hopes that Caesar will let them pass through his lines, or at least that they will distract him from his siege. But Caesar is merciless. He refuses to open his lines or feed the refugees. He lets them starve between his walls and those of Elysia, where they can be seen by both sides. He wants to demoralize Vercingetorix and force him to surrender. But Vercingetorix does not surrender. He holds on to his pride and his faith in his cause. He encourages his men to resist and wait for their salvation. Their salvation arrives at the end of September, when the Gallic relief force finally reaches Elysia. It is led by two chieftains, Commius of the Atrobates and Vercassivalonus of the Arverni, who is Vercingetorix's cousin. They have gathered warriors from many tribes, eager to join the fight against Rome. They are shocked by what they see. Elysia surrounded by Roman fortifications, thousands of starving people between them, Caesar's army ready for battle. They do not hesitate. They launch an attack on Caesar's outer wall, hoping to create a breach and join forces with Vercingetorix. At the same time, Vercingetorix leads his men in a sortie against the inner wall, trying to break out of the siege. The battle is fierce and chaotic, 
as both sides fight with courage and desperation. Caesar commands his army from a central hill, where he can see the whole battlefield. He sends orders to his officers, who lead their legions in defending the walls. He also has a reserve force of cavalry and infantry, ready to intervene where needed. The Gauls have the advantage of surprise and momentum. They manage to penetrate some sections of the wall, but they are met by fierce resistance from the Romans, who counterattack with swords and javelins. The Romans also use their superior engineering skills to create traps and obstacles for the Gauls, such as pits, stakes, and fire. The battle rages for hours, with no clear outcome. The Gauls are determined to reach Elysia, while the Romans are determined to hold them back. The casualties are high on both sides, and the ground is littered with bodies and blood. The turning point comes when Vercassivalanus leads a group of 60,000 men to attack a weak spot in Caesar's Wall, where a river valley had prevented a continuous fortification. He hopes to exploit this gap and enter Caesar's camp. He charges forward with his men, shouting their war cries. Caesar sees this move and reacts quickly. He orders Labienus, his trusted lieutenant, to take his cavalry and stop Vercassivalanus. He also gathers 13 cohorts of his best soldiers, about 6,000 men, and leads them personally in a daring maneuver. He leaves his camp and attacks Vercassivalanus from behind. This is a risky move, as he exposes himself and his men to enemy fire. But he trusts his skill and his luck, and he inspires his men with his bravery. He rides at the head of his troops, waving his sword and shouting, Follow me! Labienus and his cavalry reach the gap first, and engage Vercassivalanus' men in a fierce fight. They are outnumbered, but they fight with discipline and skill. They hold the line as long as they can, waiting for Caesar's arrival. Caesar arrives just in time, as Labienus' men are about to be overwhelmed. He charges into the rear of Vercassivalanus' army, causing panic and confusion among the Gauls. They are caught between two Roman forces, and they have nowhere to run. The Gauls begin to break and flee, but they are pursued by the Romans, who cut them down mercilessly. Vercassivalanus is among the slain, along with many of his men. The defeat of Vercassivalanus signals the end of the battle. The other Gallic attacks are also repelled by the Romans, who hold their walls against all odds. Vercingetorix sees that his relief force has failed, and that he has no chance of escaping. He realizes that he has lost the battle, and with it, the war. He makes one last gesture of defiance. He gathers his weapons and armor, mounts his horse, and rides out of Elysia. He rides toward Caesar's camp, where he is surrounded by Roman soldiers. He throws down his arms at Caesar's feet, offering himself as a prisoner. Caesar accepts his surrender with a cold smile. He has won the Battle of Elysia one of his greatest victories. He has crushed the Gallic Rebellion and secured his domination over Gaul. He orders his men to celebrate their triumph, but he also orders them to take care of the wounded and bury the dead. He knows that he has paid a high price for his victory. About 12,800 of his men have been killed or wounded in the battle. He also knows that he has inflicted a terrible toll on the Gauls. About 250,000 of them have been killed or wounded in the battle, and another 40,000 have been captured. He decides to spare most of the captives, but he keeps Vercingetorix as a trophy for his future triumph in Rome. He looks at Vercingetorix with a mix of admiration and contempt. He respects him as a worthy opponent, but he also despises him as a rebel leader. He wonders what will become of him and his people. He does not know that Vercingetorix will spend six years in prison in Rome before being executed by strangulation during Caesar's triumphal parade in 46 BC. As the Gallic leader surrenders, Caesar is unaware of the twists and turns that await him in the future. The Roman general does not foresee that Vercingetorix will become a symbol of resistance and pride for his people, and that his name will echo through the ages as a legend. The conqueror of Gaul does not anticipate that his victory at Elysia will also mark the beginning of his downfall, 
as his political enemies in Rome will grow more jealous and fearful of his power and popularity. The man who changed history does not know that his name will live on in history, as one of the greatest generals and statesmen of all time, and that his deeds will inspire countless writers, artists, and leaders. He only knows that he has won the Battle of Elysia, and that he has conquered Gaul. He looks at the sky, where the sun is setting over the horizon. He feels a surge of joy and pride, mixed with a hint of sadness and regret. He whispers to himself, Veni vidi vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. We will continue to release more videos like this one in the future. Thank you for watching and see you next time.